ability that it will bring you destruction, nothing, nothing less. So all, all narrative is, is the sense of the ambiguous or equivocal sense of the problematics and the effort to deal with it. Now, if that's the case, it seems to operate at right angles, at right angles to the thing what I call a story. And sometimes you find in a, in, a, in a kind of work by most everybody, most stories have narratives in them, or possible narratives in them. And most narratives are found usually wrapped around by story, but they're not always. Uh, it's not always. You can have narratives that operate differently as long as they have this. And that's when certain collages actually, or collage-like structures seem to be proto-narrative. For example, when uh, the when the Franciscan priest Bernardino da Sahagun uh, decided to, uh, literally to map the great culture of the Aztecs, he had Aztec informants and asked them questions. One of one of his tasks was to ask questions about individual words and interrogate the uh, the native speaker about what their experience was in those words. And so you would get things like. A mushroom, what, something called a mushroom. You got the definition of a mushroom. In definition of a mushroom, read in Aztec, it is round like a severed head. It sounds very Aztec, yes. <laughs> <laughs> or they did a they did a gorge. It, it, it is now, or it is not, it is narrow. It is it is narrow. It is dark. It is open. It is it is open. It is sunny. It is deep, it is shallow, it is horrible, it is sharp. And you get this changing, you say, say, sequential changes in attitude. It seems to project an imaginary narrative in which this person is trying to reenact going through, through a gorge. In fact, I suspect that what his Aztec informants who had no idea what a definition was, they, you imagine a, a Franciscan saying, telling his Aztec, inform, his Aztec translator, Tell them I'd like to have the definition of, of a gorge. What would an Aztec have to do with a definition? They wouldn't have the idea, they had no word for a definition. So the, the native speaker, who is the translator, must have said to them, What's your experience of a gorge? And they gave their experience of the gorge. And the experience came in narrative order. It came at a but it didn't come in a story because they thought they just were being told to give their, feel, their experience. An experience is not story like <coughs> necessarily, although it may be. Now, what does this have to do with the question of material? The question is, is there something more material in the sequences of experience that are given by the Aztecs than, than an abstract account? Of, if you say, this is, this is what this means. Now, I've always thought that, always, no, I haven't always thought it, but I, in very recent years i thought that what you get out of an experience is more than what you could extract from it. That an experience has always got something extra, that has more granularity and more parts, more detail than, than an abstract account. And I rationalized it this way Think of, it, think of it this way. I, at one point back in, in the 50s, I was working for the forestry department in the United States. And I was there working in northern Idaho, which we were, it was a great forest. And we were trying literally uh, to, to, to clear, the area, clear the area of a certain kind of uh, disease that vine maple had. These flakes on the vine maple brought bacteria of some kind or other into contact and were poisoning the pine trees. And our job was to, to literally to, to get rid of as much of this vine maple as we could possibly do. And some of us were better at hand dealing with, it, with the negotiation of the hills. I was one of them. So I was one of the ones mapping, uh, mapping the terrain uh, that had to be free of vine maple. And I'll do it. what I would do is I would have these, these cords that I, I would try to find an area of concentrated vine maple and then take little stakes and pin them in and then take cords and wrap them around the configuration in which I found the vine maple. 
And it was kind of pleasantly lonely work. You we were literally drunk on the smell of evergreens. And it was very charming in some respect. It was a virgin forest. And it, it was a great pleasure. And it was such a great pleasure because even chipmunks were not afraid of you. I mean, if you saw a chipmunk there, because they, they'd never seen people. If you saw a chipmunk there, you could bend down and look at the chipmunk and look closely and chipmunk wouldn't run away if you didn't make a quick move. So it was a very startling area to begin with. And in the midst of this, I'm dragging my you know, little cold cord uh, along behind, behind me. And uh, it snags on something. I'm in this sort of deliriously pleasant state. And I'm tugging on the cord, tugging on the cord, and it doesn't go. And I turn around, and I think, What's, what is this? And I start to go back, and then I stop. Because I see about as far from me as, as you are over there, standing there, I see a grizzly bear. And the grizzly bear, for the moment, is, 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 you know, is hunched. And a grizzly bear is not like a little black bear. Little, you know, our camp used to be where we had this camp where the little black bears used to come out and raid the garbage. And we used to drive them away by throwing tennis balls at them. We shouldn't hurt them, but panic them. But the grizzly was not like that. The grizzly was not a little black bear. And I, when I did this first, I froze. And I wanted to see what would happen. Because I realized if the grizzly was going to attack me, it would be very difficult to get away anyway. So why don't I just you know, freeze? And the grizzly sort of stood up. And I would swear it was 10 feet tall. And there I looked at the grizzly, and the grizzly looked, but they have very bad eyesight. I also knew that they don't see very well. I know a lot about these things, <laughs> more than I know now. And the grizzly bear looked and sniffed the air. And I felt a great sigh of relief, because the air was not going from me to him, to that her. It was flowing from her to me. So she didn't smell me. And it was summer when they're well fed and they're not, not, they're not terribly hungry because there's every kind of fruit and fish available in the virgin forest. And they were not suffering from hunger. And she had not just dropped her cubs. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have been in this dangerous position by, you know, by mid-July. So I thought the best thing I can do is just stand still for a while. And I stood still for a while, and then the grizzly moved off. And all the time it had been, the grizzly had been standing on my cord. <laughs> and I had the cord free again. <laughs> now, when, you, when I know the story this way, it's sort of very curious. I was convinced that the grizzly bear had been standing on the cord that I was pulling. Is that really true? I don't know. I remember that because I made a meaningful connection of the grizzly bear's appearance and the snag cord. It could have been sheer coincidence. The cord could have snagged on a root of some, on a, on a, on a, on a root of something, and the grizzly bear could just have happened to be standing up around that time because it felt like it. And yet somehow the way I told the story is the way I remembered it. And when I remember it, I can't go back and recover anything that dis disagrees with it. Once the story is told that way, that's it. So from then on, the story takes on a life of its own. You know, I, 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 I haven't told, I don't think I, I may have told Ellie the story. I don't, I don't yeah. think I, would, I, I put it in the piece, but I did tell it to you, so it already had taken shape. You told it to me recently. The there you go. I was thinking of it for some reason. So once it takes shape, it's been shaped, and this is the, one of the problems of narrative as opposed to the problem of collage, that a narrative sometimes takes too much shape. And sometimes you have to be very wary of narratives. Like I had a great, I actually had lived a life very often filled with contingency and images that were contingent. And I had a, mo I had a model I had a very charming family, the sole exception of my mother, who was a total family drag. Uh, all the others were, were lively and bohemian, and my mother was like tried to be 
an American of an ordinary sort, and she went, you know, she wasn't an American, although she didn't have, she could have, or she was an American of an unordinary sort. But the rest of the family were lively anyway. And living with my aunts and my uncles, I had, had a, there was an uncle who became, became an immediately image of image of pleasure for me, in that his life was so wonderfully unhappy and unpeculiar. And peculiar. I was very young when I was living with I was about five, or maybe, maybe no, I couldn't have been that, that old. I must have been nearly, not three yet. Uh, we were sitting on the porch in Brooklyn, and we were crossing the street. There were these th the team of guys in baseball uniforms, and they were wearing the gray uniforms with red, red socks. And I was sitting with my Uncle Lou on the back porch, and I said to him, what team are they? And he said, the Red Sox. And I started to laugh, because I knew they weren't the Red Sox. They weren't the Boston Red Sox. And I, he, was, he was making a joke. I, so I was a two and a half year old kid who re realized that, that Lou was a very funny guy. And then he would come home under odd circumstances and live, to live with, stay with my grandmother who lived with three of, three of her daughters. And he would always show up in the weird circumstances. Once he showed up with this rather beautiful, beautiful coffee-colored woman with, uh, who had a great feather boa. And he told us she was an Indian princess. And I thought that was kind of wonderful, too, because I thought somehow princesses were more beautiful if they were Indian princesses, as opposed to little German princesses. <laughs> <laughs> I had a taste of the exotic. What did you do? And, but I, I enjoyed the, uh, I enjoyed my uncle. And then, on June 16th, 19th, June 16th or June 18th, 1934, a family got a phone call that Lou had fallen off a cliff in Yosemite and was dead. Now this was part of part of my family mythology. And I saw, saw him, imagined him climbing a cliff in Yosemite, <coughs> reaching upward, reaching for a handhold, grabbing a rock, the rock, unfortunately, dislodging, him slipping and falling 100 feet to his death at the bottom of the, in the Merced River. And, I, and that's the way I saw the story. And then I had another uncle. Seems like I'm doing a bliss. I'm drawing the seven uncles. I had another uncle who at the age of 12 was a brilliant chess player, a very brilliant chess player. He's a, he looked like a fullback for, you know, for a major team, even at the age of 13 or 12. Uh, but he was literally the best chess player in Scranton. And Emmanuel Lasker, yeah, well, Scranton has its distinctions. Emmanuel Lasker, Emmanuel Lasker was coming to town uh, to, pl to play simultaneous chess against 20 people. Well, he would be blindfolded and he'd play 20 different people at the same time. Uh, this was a standard performance for, again, get paid a fair amount of money for doing this. And the, because Sam was such a great, a great kid player, they, they bought him a ticket to the thing and he, he took one of the chess boards and he was one of the 20 people playing Lanesker. And the game developed in which the usual manner, which Lasser killed, killed the weaker, weaker players very rapidly, uh, disposed of them. And he was coming down the home stretch, and he, there were still about three people left, in which the 12-year-old was it. And Sam had a winning game. My uncle had, had a win one game. Of course, he would have to close it. In other words, of course, he would have to close it. He might be intimidated by Lasker's main fame, into not, not into plundering when he was, should be should be literally squeezing Lasker into the, into the maid. And he debated. Lasker offered him a draw, which was a lot of distinction. And Sam kept begging, should I take the draw? He took the draw. And ever afterward, ever afterward, I always thought and what was wrong was he should never have taken the draw. So these were my two images of my uncles. The one who, who was trying to do something he maybe couldn't do, 
or the one who literally should never have taken a draw and took the draw. And I did it, talked about this in a piece I did it some time ago in which I used the images of the two. I said, what is, what is a poet supposed to be? Which one is it? The answer was never play for the draw. But then I was curious about the whole story. And I decided not to take the story of the draw, but I was fascinated with my uncle who died in Yosemite and about whom nobody heard much anymore at all. The body wasn't shipped back. And the whole thing was sort of strange. There seemed to be a vacuum around the history of Lou. And I searched with the, the, searched the net and found an obituary for Lou in the Berkeley Daily Gazette. Um, the obituary published uh, in uh, 1934 on June 18th, in which it said that Saturday, Saturday Lou Kisses of San Francisco, which I wasn't aware that he was, of San Francisco fell to his death from the, from the, Nevada, the Nevada Fall, he had the brink of the Nevada Fall, uh, by, and his body was carried away by the uh, Merced River or else the spray of the, the, the great pressure of the downpour uh, of water made it impossible for anybody to find the body. Uh, the rangers, park rangers, searched the spray as well as they could, found nothing. And the CCC guys searched the surrounding area, and then he came to the conclusion that he was held so deeply underwater that he uh, couldn't be found, or the water had been washed him down to the next fall. Now, the one thing, though, that seems is, is they explain they explained that he would have been, he had been standing barefoot in the in the in the river at the, at the brink of the fall, and had been had, had slipped and then literally felt carried away by the current to his death. And the question struck me, how did they know he was barefoot? I mean, how, how did they know he was barefoot? And uh, I couldn't, I, I figured, well, maybe, maybe, maybe what happened is the, the people who reported the, the, his loss reported the barefoot. But what spoke would make, make them concentrate on the barefoot in this? It's true that with bare feet you have more slippage possible, unless your feet are very rough, uh, than a pair of good boots, climbing boots. A pair of good climbing boots would probably have given you more traction. But what was he doing barefooted? Why, why, why did he go barefoot into the river? To preserve boots? Or was there some sort of funny act that he was performing? See, before this I had a heroic view of it, of his, of his fall in the seminary. Now I was beginning to wonder whether he wasn't, as it were, playing a Greek sculpture or something, picking up one foot in the air as if he were going to do, you know, do a, a, a ballet step. And then he was reduced to one foot on the ground, and the one foot slipped, and that was it. For a photograph? What was the point of all this? Maybe, they, maybe the shoes were still there. Did, he, did, he leave, did, they, did they bring the shoes back with them? Or, or somehow I have an image of two shoes standing on the precipice, at the edge of the precipice of the Nevada Fall that had been left there by, you know, by Lou before the photograph was to be taken. And now I know much less than I knew before because I, I don't, there's, there's no way there, everything after that's a dead end. So I thought, well, let me see the other end of my, the other side of my uh, storytelling technique my image making capacity, because I had turned my uh, uncle into this uh, radical failure, that is this brilliant kid whose life was blighted forever after that by the fact that he accepted a draw. That was the way I looked at it, and I'm not sure that that's reasonable at all. A kid who gets a draw with Oscar, the world champion, and you get a draw with him, so any 12-year-old kid would look terrific accepting the draw. And nobody would have done it. And I, and I kept saying, no, no, he should never have taken the draw. Well, I don't know what I would have done. Probably I wouldn't have taken the draw. But the point is, you don't know what the situation is like. So I wanted to find out what everybody said. You know, what did they say in Scranton about his good taking the draw? They probably, I would imagine they might have celebrated 
I mean, have a world champion come in and have somebody take a draw with him, and the one who takes a draw with him is a 12 year old. I should imagine they would have celebrated. I couldn't find any reference to it in, in the Scranton papers in the, 1930s, in the 1930s. Although that event was earlier, actually, I'm sorry about that. The death of Lou was 34. But the event with Lou it must have been in the early 20s. When, and I, I went through all the, all the newspapers around to find if I could find the story of the, the, the Blaster coming to Scranton. And I, I couldn't find it. So now I'm faced with two stories that have wonderful, wonderful form of prop narrative properties that I'm not sure have any truth in them at all. The heroic climbing of Yosemite may have been merely an act of vanity, uh, to, you know, to show somebody, look, look, we're here. Here I am in Yosemite looking cute. Now, it's not consonant with my view of it because he was a very charming, handsome guy. It didn't seem to me that that would be his style. So what did he mean? Did he mean something? Was it a suicide? Was, was it a fatigue of life, a disgust of life that they let him do it on purpose? That, that's also a demonic possibility, but I have no way of knowing. But the damn shoes keep troubling me. I keep thinking it sounds like, the, you know, it, it literally sounds like the Greek philosopher who, wound up, who jumped into the volcano and left his shoes behind. Was that what it was? Was he putting an end to something? He had never been able to find himself. But he was only 24 years old, so. Not finding yourself at 24 is not a, is not a big deal. Not finding yourself to your 30 or 35 is a big deal, but he didn't make it that far. So it comes in that contingency may have played, it may have been nothing other than a pure contingency. It's the same way that my death of my father, uh, the death of my father three weeks earlier was a death based essentially on the, on the inavailability of penicillin. Penicillin had not been invented yet. Sulfur drugs were not available. And my father died of having his throat painted with silver nitrate, which is very mild in very mild and dilute form, kills streptococci, but which in, 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 in more concentrated form can kill you. The doctor was incompetent and he killed him. It wasn't his fault. So he was 27 years old. So what can I make of the imaginary death of my, my family? Nothing at all. That is to say, well, I know the uncertainty situation is more like what's going on. And so, in a way, I, now I've come to regard collage as a form, a form of defense against the banality of narrative. A narrative is a defense against the dislocation, the exaggerated dislocation that the collage produces. And so I suspect that there are strategies, each of which is appropriate at some particular time for what you're doing. And you're on the, but I, what I'm trying to do is understand, or what I mean is come to tune to something. I'm trying to come to an idea of what's going on. And any means that are available <coughs> is what I recommend. You use any means that's available, whether it's collage, or it's like narrative, or it's like pseudo-narrative, or pseudo-collage. And whatever works, works. How do you know it works? You know from experience. The same way Oliver Wendell Holmes said, Ju judgment is not based on the law, it's based on experience. Unfortunately, the experience of the people we have in our present Supreme Court is such that I wouldn't feel too happy about it.
reading is there's a reading on Monday with Lilian Giroudon and Michael Palmer at the uh, La Librairie Michel Ignazi, and there's one on Sunday, June 26th, with Michael Par Palmer, uh, Lola Poe, uh, Eric Suchet, Virginie oh. Poitrasson, and Et vous pouvez avoir les informations sur le site doublechange.org. Si vous voulez vous inscrire sur la liste de diffusion, vous pouvez aussi le faire sur, sur le site. Thank you again so much, you. Uh, David and Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.